Okay, folks. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome today to today's webinar entitled How Can COVID-19 Make the Ontario Dairy Sector More Resilient? This is the second in a series of sector-specific uh, webinars that are supported by the Aero Food Institute at the University of Guelph as part of their Growing Stronger program. Thank you all for joining us. My name is Dave Kelton. I'm a faculty member at the University of Guelph and have the privilege of serving as the Dairy Farmers of Ontario Research Chair in Dairy Cattle Health. I'll be your moderator this morning. This webinar is a joint presentation of Dairy at Guelph, Dairy Farmers of Ontario and the Livestock Research and Innovation Corporation. <clears throat> and a special thanks to Charlotte Wall from the Poultry Industry Council, who's in the background here and, and providing the technical support for this session. Depending on our age, many of us will always remember where we were when Neil Armstrong first stepped on the moon or, or the Twin Towers were hit by terrorist controlled airplanes. And in a similar fashion, I think the date of March 12, 2020 stands out for me as the real start of the uh, COVID pandemic and the impact it's had on my life and I think of, of those around me. For more than six months now, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, we've been faced with an altered reality as the pandemic has impacted us personally, professionally, our families, our businesses, our province, and our country. The dairy sector in Ontario has faced its fair share of, of COVID-related challenges, but our hope is that if, as we've met these challenges, we have learned a few things and are preparing ourselves to better face whatever comes next, whether it's this second wave of COVID that we seem to be entering now, or an animal health epidemic, or a weather-related issue. Today, we've assembled a tremendous panel of speakers who have been at the forefront of, of dealing with the impact of COVID-19 on the dairy sector. And they've kindly agreed to share their perspectives with us on some of what they've learned in these past six months. So thank you to all our panelists for being here. Each of the six panelists will have, uh, or five panelists, will have about six minutes to respond to an opening question that I will pose. Once all five of our panelists have spoken, we'll open the webinar to questions from you, our, our live audience. If you have questions, please type them into the Q&A box on your screen, and, and that should be available to you at the bottom of the screen as, as one of the options there. And if you would, please indicate which panelist um, you're addressing this particular question to, if, if you have someone in mind. We'll do our best to get through as many of the questions as we can. Our target length for this webinar is about an hour, but if we, uh, if, if we have good questions and good discussions, we can go over by a little bit. So that said, uh, we will get started. And to begin with, um, I'll, in, I'll welcome our, our first speaker, and that's Mike Von Massow. He's the OAC Chair in Food System Leadership and Associate Professor in the Department of Food, Agricultural, and uh, Resource Economics here at the University of Guelph. His interests include the structure and performance of food value chains, and you will have likely heard Mike interviewed frequently on local and national radio during the COVID pandemic on some of these issues. Welcome, Mike. My question to you is, given a future pandemic or, or the second wave of COVID we are entering now, what are some of the vulnerable segments of the dairy or, or the food chain in general? Well, uh, thanks, Dave. Thanks for having me. And I, I look forward to uh, hearing all the panelists. But let, let's, let's start by uh, talking a little bit about, about our, our experience here. And, and we, we did see some vulnerabilities in the supply chain. But the first thing I think is important to say is the system worked really, really well. Um, we and, and that's not just the dairy system, that, that's the entire system. We did get some uh, issues. Uh, we, did, we did see some issues right uh, in March where, where we had shortages in grocery stores and, and actually we're dumping milk. And I think Cheryl, who's speaking next, will probably, uh, will probably get to that. But those short-term disruptions, uh, we recovered from them relatively quickly. So to say that we had... Uh, to say that we had issues uh, uh, is honest, but to, to, to say that there were, were crises that, that uh, uh, sorry, uh, to say that there was a crisis that caused sort of confidence in the system to go away uh, is inaccurate. And, and, you know, I've seen some recent 
polling data that suggests that, that Canadians feel really good about their food system, feel really good about how it responded. And in fact, we've enhanced trust by the way, uh, notwithstanding some of the panic buying and some of the things we're seeing now, uh, really uh, reinforced the, the, the resiliency of our supply chain. That said, let's, let's, let's take a step back and say, where might we uh, where might we see some problems? And the first thing I think it's it's important for us to differentiate between demand-based and supply-based disruptions to the supply chain. What we've seen for the most part uh, are demand-based disruptions uh, in the first in the first uh, wave of the pandemic. Demand-based means we saw shifts away from you know we, within 48 hours we saw every restaurant in the country close. That means the supply chain serving those were disrupted. Uh, it means the products we were producing in the packaging that we were producing for those markets uh, was disrupted and we had to think differently and divert product and change product and put it into different packages, which caused some disruption, which caused some shortages. And because of the nature of milk, the perishable products, and again, I, I expect Cheryl will get to this, uh, we saw some short-term, uh, sh some short-term uh, uh, need for disposal of product. What I would argue, though, is that those demand-based, uh, we responded in Canada better than other places to those demand-based, and, and part of the, to, to some of those demand-based uh, disruptions, and part of that was the structure of our industry, the, the regional nature of our industry, the central desk selling under supply management, which I think uh, allowed us to divert product very quickly from one processor to another to, to fill the need. And, and I think that that's worth mentioning. On the other side, things that can happen in a pandemic are the are, are supply-based disruptions. And, and those are uh, if we have processors shut down, uh, if we had issues either animal or human at farms uh, and milk production was affected, and to a lesser degree for the dairy industry, although uh, not insignificant, uh, if border or, or logistics issues uh, caused problems, those supply type disruptions tend to be longer term. They, they tend to take us longer to recover from. Uh, and so it's important to make that distinction. So as we, uh, as we sit back and say, where is their risk? Um, I think we're seeing some current increase we're getting into the second wave that epidemiologists who who know this better than i ha have been predicting for months uh, and and it's probably the current thing that's on our mind how will we respond how will the uh, how, how will the the system uh, respond and i think it's worth talking about some of those things uh, in in a bigger picture so as we get into the into the second wave uh, a couple of things that I think are different from the first wave. Uh, you know, as Dave said, we, we really had a profound impact uh, when everything shut down at the same time. Uh, you know, I, I, I think about, you know, we started to hear some rumblings and then on the Monday, uh, uh, you know, the 15th or 16th of March, all of a sudden, everything was closed and not, now we've learned some of those lessons and I think there's better anticipation of what some of the changes we might see are uh, so there's less likely to be there's less likely to be surprises I think the supply chain is is in better position now to respond as we enter the second wave uh, than than it was uh, in the first wave and even though I've already said that that significant degree I think we came through it really really well uh, there's also more confidence in the system uh, that, that, again, we're seeing some panic buying of things like, like paper towels, but, but some hoarding. I came out of a grocery store the other day and saw someone pushing a cart full of, uh, of, of their groceries and pulling a cart uh, full of paper towels. And I shook my head and said, you know, you know, this is unnecessary. But for the most part, consumers are saying we saw it bend. It didn't break. Uh, we're not going to have to. Uh, we're not going to have to sort of stock up big inventories, and that takes one of the factors that led to shortages uh, off the table. 
So where are the where are the vulnerabilities? If you know, if I'm wrong that things aren't going to be the, as big a deal, where are the vulnerabilities? The first is purchase locations. Uh, we have lots of choice. The stores have done a uh, uh, have done a good job of uh, the joys of working from home. Uh, we, we've got some ear scratching going on in the background, and I apologize. But the purchase locations are spread out. We've got lots of options for grocery stores. Uh, the infrastructure is better. The provisions that they've made for selling are better. And even if, in an extreme case, uh, access to stores was closed, we've also built the processes for doing uh, and collect and those sorts of delivery things. So for the most part, uh, I think uh, there's not a concern around retail. Restaurants uh, will likely get worse before they get better. Uh, indoors may go away as it has in Montreal uh, and in some high risk areas. I wouldn't be surprised if we saw that again. And uh, as weather gets cooler, it's going to be less appealing. Uh, it's going to be less appealing to be on a, on a patio. Uh, and as cases go up, we're going to be less confident about going out to eat. So, so restaurants will go down, uh, and we will see some again some of the same adjustments that we saw in the in the first round. Um, and we'll still eat just as much, but the relative demand for products continues to change. You know, we eat more of some things. Uh, we eat more of some things in, in at home. We drink more milk at home than we do in restaurants. We eat more cheese in restaurants, think pizza. And so those sorts of adjustments will have to happen. But we've done it once before, and we understand that those changes are coming, and there'll be less of a surprise. Uh, I would argue that at the processing level, we're less vulnerable uh, than, say, the beef uh, beef processors for, and again, we're also done a lot of things. I've spoken to some dairy processors. We've also implemented a lot of things that uh, that protect workers, PPE separation. But dairy processing plants have less density of people working in, in close proximity than uh, than other facilities. So again, that's a place where things could happen, but are less likely to happen. Uh, and, and then we get to the farm level. Uh, I, I had a dairy farmer tell me not long ago that they've been social distancing for a hundred years. And so uh, that, that really the number of farms we have, the dispersions of those farms, the risk of interruption from a human perspective is relatively low. And we saw that truckers can minimize contact and we've been doing that. Uh, if we were to have an animal disease uh, outbreak, which is relatively low risk, uh, I'm told, uh, in dairy, uh, there's more of an issue uh, on that side, and we might have to quarantine lar larger areas. But from a, from a human epidemic perspective, I think things are really good. Uh, and, and the only thing that, that really I see is going to be a discussion is whether we need to build buffer inventories uh, or, or buffer storage uh, to prevent cases of, of dumping milk like we did when there were this, this, these, these demand disruptions that we saw. And, and again, that becomes a, that becomes a trade-off. Building that storage, using that storage costs us money. And if we are really in a relatively good position to respond to it, I would argue that, that, that perhaps we don't need to think about it a whole bunch. But that's the one area that sort of perishable product moving from farms to processors that that can cause pain at the farm level if we have to if we have to dump milk so i've likely already gone over time it's hard to sit, sit in six minutes but uh, thank you for the opportunity thank you very much mike <clears throat> appreciate your insights there a number of people have joined us in in the last little bit so i'll, I'll perhaps just remind folks that we're going to hold the questions uh for our panelists until the end until all five have spoken but if you have questions in there is a, a q a box at the bottom of your screen please type your questions in there and, and that way we'll be able to prepare them and, and pass them along to the panelists so at this point, we'll move to our second speaker, and we're very pleased to be joined by Cheryl Smith. Um, Cheryl is the general manager and CEO of Dairy Farmers of Ontario, which represents all of Ontario's almost 3,500 dairy producers. 
Cheryl has extensive experience in the dairy sector and including a long history on milk processing side of the industry as well. Thank you for joining us this morning, Cheryl. Um, so my, my question to you this, this morning is, and I seem to have lost my notes here. Did I, of, uh, did I take over? Did I take over the screen? Uh, I think you did, but but that's that's fine. So I'll just pose my question and then leave it to you. <laughs> um, on the milk production and delivery end of the value chain, then what have we learned from the COVID nineteen impact on on our dairy industry? Sure. Uh, thanks so much for having me today. Um, really appreciate this opportunity, and um, love to speak about dairy. Uh, and if we were to just uh, set it up as looking at, um, you know, the resilience of dairy through COVID, um, there's no question that um, this is a great moment for um, dairy. And um, we are in, in the face of a global pandemic um, and the COVID environment. Uh, the dairy farmers have really, really stepped up and are just doing what needs to be done to make sure that consumers get dairy products on their table. So if we were to, uh, the, there was mention of some milk disposal and that's certainly true. But if we take it in the context, what I wanted to share with you is just a little bit of background um, as to where what happened and where we're at and also put things in perspective. So when we think about um, the milk disposal, it was a matter of a few days and it was a fraction of a percentage of production. And so let's just have a look at um, how, how that happened. Um, so from a bigger perspective, if we look at milk trends, we can see that there's been um, per capita consumption declines for 40 years on fluid milk. And really, when you put that in perspective, this is still a beverage that consumers drink all the time. It's the highest, um, it's the highest volume, the highest penetration category, uh, and it's the highest frequently purchased. But when we when we look at what's been happening over time, um, 40 years of per capita consumption declines and about 10 years of absolute decline, so not even keeping up with population growth. Now, if we look at what happened as the pandemic um, became an issue for us all, we can see that there was a dramatic increase of uh, milk purchases. And it was huge from the perspective of that time when consumers were hoarding product. So we look at plus 24%, plus 30%. Um, and then continued double digit growth for a number of weeks. And we're now 26 weeks into this and we're almost at double digit growth that entire time. So when did the milk disposal happen? Well, it took place as consumers were hoarding um, and, and purchasing panic buying. And essentially what that did is that left grocery stores with empty shelves, as, as was just discussed. And um, grocery store supply chains simply aren't built for new store openings everywhere across, um, across the province, never mind across the country. So there was a supply chain backup. And um, despite the fact that consumers were demanding a lot more dairy products, uh, that producers responded and made milk more available, um, it just couldn't make its way through the system. So there were a couple days and a fraction of a percentage of milk that had to be disposed of, um, which of course any disposal of milk is too much, um, but understanding the situation, a uh, situation that hasn't happened in a hundred years, we can uh, recognize that having some sort of adjustment would be required. So again, when we knew the, that things were shutting down from um, COVID requirements, we talked to producers and said, be ready, anything can happen. We may be asking you to produce more milk and then we may be asking you to produce less. What happened 
is um, that took place. We thought that would be over a matter of weeks and months. What happened is it took place in a matter of hours um, and producers responded accordingly. So if we look at dairy in general, and we look at it across the um, across the, uh, the last number of weeks, again, 26 weeks. So this is May 14th to September 5th data. It's very current data. And you can see the consumers didn't just panic buy. They are looking, they are consuming dairy at an extremely high rate. So double digit growth, um, milk is still at plus nine, cream is plus 19, butter is plus 32, um, yogurts plus four and cheese is plus 14. So incredible, incredible rates of, of purchase. Now, if we look at the other side, as again was just discussed, you can see that there's been a dramatic decrease in food service sales. So um, that has been huge. And we know um, that this data actually uh, only covers April, um, uh, May, June. So it's kind of in the worst case scenario. We know that these trends have gotten better, but the data, there's no more recent data available to us at this point in time. And of course, we're concerned about any kind of second wave that may came, come in. So when we look at this in totality, we know that 70% uh, uh, of um, food is consumed at home, 30 outside of home. So this has a dramatic impact in the totality. But at the end of the day, what we do know is consumers' habits are evolving. Uh, dairy is becoming more and more um, depended on, and it's really no surprise. Um, nutrient density in dairy is, is, is second to none. And at the same time, dairy products also deliver um, comfort and pleasure in many cases. So you can see that spike in butter, for example, and cream. We're not going to give up having our cream in our coffee at home uh, just because um, we, we can't get to the uh, food service outlets as much. So when we, when we think about, um, you know, the resilience of dairy, I would say that this is, an, this is a time um, for certainly us in Ontario, but all Canadians to be extremely proud of the unique system we have in Canada. And it has, um, you know, is serving all very, very well, but we don't want to uh, take a rest. All the protocols we put in place need to be continued to be in place. We need to be prepared. We need to be nimble. And we know that when we have to deal with a situation, because of our system, we can deal with it in a very organized way and a very fair way, in a way that doesn't, um, you know, see dairy farmers looking for some sort of compensation for that. And at the end of the day, collaboration is really key. So what we have done um, is we've stepped up all of our meetings with um, others in the industry. So we were having a uh, um, almost daily calls with, with each of the processors to make sure we were able to respond accordingly. We were having lots of um, calls in terms of all of the um, government uh, pieces of the industry to help make sure we were prepared. And we were dealing directly with retailers and the retail associations to really say, how can we help? And much like other groups um, where there was um, there was more there were more products available and we knew that there's um that the the uh hunger that there was more hunger out there um we responded by providing dairy products where we could but knowing that the supply chain couldn't really handle uh perishables as much um producers stepped up and said okay the the food banks what they really need is cash right now and even though producers costs were were um, going up they said let's give cash to the food banks to help them get through this moment and we'll get back to providing dairy products as soon as possible when they can accommodate them and then we had actually um, our regional producers say okay and we'll actually go pick up we had some refrigerated trucks working with processors smaller trucks and we actually delivered right into the communities, you know, church basements, where parking lots, wherever we could to get product um, to consumers in need. Sorry, I've gone over my time, so I'll stop right there and I'll turn it back over to you. I will stop sharing my screen, but that's uh, that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cheryl. Appreciate your comments and and. Uh... 
we'll, uh, as, as I mentioned at the outset, we will take all questions um, for all panelists at the end. But I will ask the audience that as you're listening and as things come to mind, um, please uh, type in your questions. There's a question and answer box at the bottom of your screen. And that way we can uh, better allocate those to the speakers and as we move through our uh, Q&A session. So our next speaker on our, our panel is uh, Kelly Barrett. Um, Kelly is a food animal veterinarian and, and part owner at Heartland Veterinary Practice in Listowel, as well as a consultant working with Dairy Farmers of Ontario on the ProAction Dairy Quality Assurance Program. Welcome, Kelly. Kelly, my question for you this morning is from the perspective of an essential service provider to Ontario's dairy farms, um, would you share with us how those who support the dairy value chain can better respond to um, the, the continuing pandemic or issues that we'll, we'll have in the future. How about now? Thank you, Dave. <laughs> I, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to um, be a part of the panel today and um, I will do my best to answer your question. Um, I'll start off by saying people ask me all the time, oh, how, how are things going with the clinic? Um, you know, with COVID and everything. And, and I always respond with, oh, things are good. Not much has changed for me. Um, I live on a dairy farm. So again, not much has changed for my family. Um, and, and our clinic stayed open the whole time. So, um, however, as I prepared for this presentation, I, I realized just how far from the truth that response really is. I, uh, um, I'm an employer. First of all, I'll talk about the clinic first. We're, I'm an employer. So we have um, 50 some um, employees um, working with us. And um, let me just get my little chat here because I feel like I'm frozen. I hope that you guys can hear me okay. Um, yeah, we can, okay. we can hear Perfect. you and see you well. Thank Thanks, you. Kelly. Sorry, Dave, you were just frozen <laughs> on my screen. And I was like, what's Dave, why is he staring at me like that? Um, I apologize. So I'll start with the, the clinic. Um, I'm an employer. We have over 50 employees and, and 15 of us are large animal vets on the road every day servicing the dairy industry. Um, in that group, a um, majority of us are parents. And so um, there was a lot of waiting on bated breath to make sure that we were deemed uh, essential workers. We wanted to keep all of our staff employed. We wanted to be able to have enough staff to service our, our clientele. And we wanted to be able to um, think about what the scheduling would look like to accommodate all of our um, staff with, with managing and juggling um, their roles as parents at home because um, daycare certainly play a role. And, and I think um, that all was way more stressful looking back on it um, that, than maybe we felt at the time. It was very much just uh, like a, fighting fires, right? We're just left, right, and center. Okay, this is what we're going to do. Um, but we implemented quite a few changes at our clinic to um, minimize the risk to our, um, to our staff, but also to our clients. So for example, we've gone curbside. So people, there's no clients entering our clinics. Uh, people need to phone ahead um, either from their homes or even from the parking lot uh, to let us know what it is that they, they need and then we will set it out for them to pick up. Um, so for farmers, that's, that's the primary way or we're delivering things um, to their farm when we're uh, at their, coming to the farm for herd health visits. Um, we also kept all of our veterinarians out of the clinic um, and we used a separate section. We're, we're fortunate because we are such a large practice. Um, we have a, an embryo transfer section of our practice so we able to use that as our home base. And so we moved laundry out there. We wore, we continue to wear masks when we're, when we're coming in the clinic. Um, we really minimize the, the foot traffic even within our building to um, adhere to as many of the biosecurity principles that um, we've been told are, are potentially helpful for, for preventing COVID communication. We also um, talk to our clients a lot more, partly in, in to, understand what their level of risk aversion is when it comes to us coming to their farm. This is especially important at the beginning. We would call and say, is it okay for us to come to the farm? And similarly, do you have any risk factors that we shouldn't be coming to your farm? 
you know, did you recently go on a trip where you're traveling outside of the country? Do you have any family members that are immune compromised that, you know, you want to try and keep um, things as safe as possible? We um, also um, did our best to social distance. Um, it's quite it's quite easy on some farms when I'm at the back of the cow and the farmers at the front of the cow were able to keep that social distance. Um, but there are some situations, emergency calls, um, where we do need to be uh, within the, the two meter rule. And so we um, would wear masks um, and, and do our best uh, to try and keep everybody um, safe. So certainly the efficiency uh, of our of our work uh, has suffered. We, it takes us longer to uh, get our day to day stuff done. And um, but when we're a business that is client focused, uh, we've adapted by just changing the way that we do things, increasing that communication um, and, and uh, doing our very best to continue to provide the best service to our clients. Also, from a biosecurity standpoint, um, we were used to talking about animal biosecurity and farm biosecurity, and now we've added another element of human biosecurity, uh, disease, disease prevention in, in the people and our clients. And that's been a real eye opener, uh, definitely benefit to have the ProAction program um, under, underway so that we've been talking about biosecurity. These principles are well entrenched in many of our, our dairy farms already. Um, but there were some things that we had to adapt to. There were some parts of the farm that became off limits. You know, we tried to, to avoid going in the milk house. Um, but as service providers, uh, we needed to take leadership um, and show, lead by example, wearing masks, cleaning things, um, being aware of, of everything that we touched on the farm and wiping it down um, and, and trying to um, help our producers to have everything that they need to keep their family safe um, when it comes to disinfection. I think um, one thing that, that has really changed, and, and this does not necessarily apply to vets because we are not um, allowed to do cold calls, but I certainly see this with other service providers. Um, there's, we, we can't be doing these cold calls anymore. People are making appointments. They are dropping off little cards on farm to say, oh, I'm gonna be in your area on this day. If you'd like to talk, um, I would really like to stop by. They're wearing masks. Um, so I, I think that there, there's just been an overall um, shift in, in the way that we're doing things on farms that has made it um, really effective and, and little workarounds. I really like what uh, Cheryl said that, you know, we need to be nimble. And, and I think that's exactly what we're doing is we're learning as we go what, what will work, what, what are some new ideas as to how we can um, still maintain communication and, and offer services while keeping everyone safe. For farmers, I see on the farm, um, you know, inventory control has become an issue, right? We have to be aware, We, have, you know, if you're coming to the farm, we'll just bring whatever I need. Um, I'm going through uh, shelves and cupboards to make sure things are under control. We have experienced some back orders of, of products, certainly PPE, but also some medications um, as a result of the pandemic. Um, and we just need to um, keep on top of that so that we don't, um, you know, animals don't suffer as a result of a lack of um, availability of any products. And communication, again, I'll go back to this because I think it's a really important one. In food animal practice, we've always done telemedicine, which is where, you know, we're, we're talking about cases on the phone with clients. We already have established that vet client patient relationship. And we are a lot um, more prepared, I would say, in the food animal sector to be able to have those conversations with farm, farmers about individual animals or situations that are happening and, and come up with a plan just over the phone rather than having to come out uh, to the farm every time, or at least we can chat on the phone and triage what, what needs to be seen now versus what can wait or um, having on-farm um, treatment protocols in place has been extremely valuable during this, uh, this whole um, year of us, of us kind of navigating things. And uh, last but not least, I really wanted to touch on it because when I hear the word resiliency, I can't help but think about um, ourselves as individuals and, and uh, our mental health. And we know that those working in ag, especially farmers, um, are extremely resilient people. Um, but with this added stress and uncertainty from, from all of those levels of being um, parents to employers and um, trying to get their products out and, and not always knowing if there's a market for it or, or just having that unknown um, out there, I think, um, and, and, I, and I speak to this with a um, 
very sincere uh, perspective because we uh, at our clinic um, suffered a tragic loss during this, this COVID time um, as a result as well. I think mental health needs to be top of mind when we talk about the resiliency of, of farmers and, and everyone in our industry. It's important to slow down. It's important for us to check in on each other, to know that it's okay to not be okay. Some days you're gonna cope with things just fine. And then there's other days where it's gonna be the straw that broke the camel's back. And, and uh, I, I think it's extremely important for us um, to, to check in on each other and uh, acknowledge that this added stress um, it, is important to openly communicate. There's no, there's no shame, there's no, get rid of the stigma of about talking about mental health. So with that, I'll turn it back to you, Dave. Thanks very much, Kelly. Really appreciate your comments there. And, and thank you for bringing up the issue of mental health, because I think it's, it's, uh, it's, as you very appropriately said, it's something that we have traditionally not been good about talking about. And, and I think this it's times like these where we really need to do that. So thank you. Um, again, I will remind the attendees that we will have an open Q&A session at the end. And so please, if you have questions, um, post them uh, using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, type them in, and that way we can prepare the speakers. Uh, we've got a couple questions already and, and we're hoping for a whole lot more. At this point, I'll introduce our next speaker and, and it's Mike McMorris. Mike has a long history in the beef sector, but now is the CEO of the Livestock Research and Innovation Corporation where he works with all of Ontario's livestock and poultry organizations to keep Ontario's agricultural sector at the cutting edge of innovation and prosperity. So welcome, Mike, and thank you for joining us. My question to you is the impact of COVID has been felt across all animal and poultry sectors and, and may have some lasting impacts and, and different impacts across those sectors. What will the post-pandemic livestock and poultry industry look like in Ontario? Thanks, Dave. And a couple of people have uh, thanked Charlotte already, but certainly thanks to Dave, Charlotte, and Gisa again with Dairy Farmers for setting this webinar up. I think it's uh, a really good opportunity to get some different perspectives and, and uh, ideally at the end, we'll tie them all together and see what does that mean for Ontario livestock. Um, to think ahead regarding the dairy sector, I considered three factors. First was how was the industry positioned going into the pandemic? Second, how did it adapt to the short-term impacts of COVID? And third, what sort of world will, will it be operating in when things return to something approaching normal? Entering the pandemic, the dairy sector was doing well. It was steadily implementing proaction and dealing well with consumer concerns. I would observe uh, that one unheralded benefit of the supply management system, though Cheryl did touch on it, it's the ability to drive change such as this relative to some other sectors. Labor was a growing challenge, but overall the system seemed pretty resilient. When COVID hit, the supply chain of the dairy sector like those of other livestock sectors was exposed as a bit more complex than many knew. Uh, we've heard of some of the adjustments that had to be made uh, as the demand profiles of retail and food service changed. Uh, those were managed well, and as Cheryl said, there were uh, very limited uh, real impacts and very, uh, very limited in optics impacts with consumers. Uh, and as Mike Von Mas already uh, said, uh, the uh, patio experience is going to be lo quickly losing its appeal as the snow starts to fly. So we I think we can expect some of those shifts in, in demand patterns uh, to reemerge. Post-pandemic, this is harder because it seems sure now that COVID is something we'll have to learn to live with rather than something we actually say goodbye to. Um, that makes the starting point of post-pandemic rather blurry. Every livestock will be, sector though will be affected by the fact that all governments have been forced to take actions that only months ago would have been unthinkable. The national deficit for this year is sure to be eight times the previous record of $55 billion following the economic crash of 2008. The federal and Ontario governments will be struggling financially, financially for many years to come. And finally, I was great. It was great to hear Mike von Massa say that consumer trust has risen. I think we can expect a, a greater focus on a trusted food supply going forward. And by trusted, I mean available, authentic, and accountable. Okay, so with that as the input, here are my five predictions for the dairy industry. Number one, 
fewer people. Labor was already an issue, and now the impact of worker health is front and center. This will mean more automation throughout the entire system, processing and at the farm level. It will also mean that industry must take on a greater role in attracting, training, and retaining workers. Number two, artificial intelligence becomes real. As more labor is done automatically, data capture will become routine. On its own, data is interesting, but paired with artificial intelligence, it can be a goldmine. Over the past 20 years, many people have been trying to build momentum in livestock data capture, sharing, and analysis. But program, progress, honestly, has been quite limited to date. Success remains all about infrastructure, ease of use, trust, and return on investment. It won't happen overnight, but AI is about to get real for agriculture. Number three, more collaboration across sectors. There are some really good examples of Ontario Livestock Groups working together. Ontario Livestock and Poultry Council, Farm and Food Care, Livestock Research Innovation Corporation. But there are many more challenges that need a cross-sector approach. At the highest level, we need to work together to avoid consumers reaching a tipping point past which in their minds, livestock equals bad. Anyone over 60 on this call can recall a time when smoking did not equal bad in most minds. To somebody under 40, that's almost unimaginable. A more quantitative example is cross-sector foreign animal disease. And as much as it's been mentioned that the chances of that may be low, it is something that has massive impact. The estimated cost of a foot and mouth disease outbreak in Canada is $65 billion or 10 times that of our BSE experience. Following the outbreak in the United Kingdom in 2001, we did get somewhat serious about preparedness, but now we simply have to develop and regularly test a complete cross-sector plan, one that includes prevention and detection. Remember, with a multi-species disease, dairy's defense is only as strong as the weakest link, which could be another sector altogether. Greater collaboration will be needed in research as well, because I'm afraid that governments under financial pressure are likely to see research funds as an area of uh, savings the cuts. Number four, a greater link to human health. Unlike any time in my life, every human on earth is living a shared experience and during a, a pandemic as the animals. And so everyone will have some knowledge and certainly opinions about zoonoses, plans, infection spread, biosecurity, etc. The approach of One Health, tying together the health of humans and animals, will gain prominence in agriculture, including the dairy sector. And number five, more accountability. One of the legacies of COVID must be and will be how we care for our seniors. Why would I mention that on a dairy webinar? Because governments, already severely strapped by deficits, will need to deal with senior care. Should an epidemic or some other major um, impact hit the livestock sector anytime soon, there will be far less appetite, much less the ability to provide the recovery programs of the past. Expect recovery funds to be limited to those sectors and individuals that can demonstrate that they have taken every step possible with regards to disease detection, prevention, and eradication. Just yesterday, I read a lengthy article based on thoughts from over three dozen medical and scientific experts about the future and what we can look forward to in about the next 18 months. And one note stuck with me as a good warning for all of us. Howard Markle, who's a historian of medicine at the University of Michigan, reminds us that the typical final act of health emergencies is what he calls global amnesia, when people forget the lessons of what they just lived through. With that caution, I believe the best way to know the future is to create it. And I believe that with solid leadership, the future of Ontario's dairy sector can be very bright. And thanks again for the opportunity. Thanks very much, Mike. Appreciate your, your comments and your insights. And, and I think um, it's important that, that we do think about this across the various sectors in, in agriculture, because as you say, we are interconnected and, and we're all in this together. So thank you. Um, I do see that, that more questions are coming in through the Q&A box at the bottom. Um, some people are putting their questions uh, into the chat section. 
Um, I, we prefer to have them in the Q&A section just because it's easier to track that way. But uh, anyway, we'll try to keep track of all of that. Um, so our next and final panelist is uh, Bonnie Denhan. Um, Bonnie is first and foremost a, a dairy farmer, dairy producer, and, and an on-farm processor as well. Um, she also sits on the Dairy Farmers of Ontario Board of Directors, representing Dufferin, Peel, Simcoe, and Wellington, and is also currently the chair of Farm and Food Care Ontario, which is a cross-sector organization with a mandate to build public trust in food and farming. So Bonnie wears a lot of hats, and thank you very much, Bonnie, for joining us this morning. My question to you is, as a leader and a strong voice representing dairy producers, uh, what do we need to learn to better prepare the dairy industry as we move forward? What is the role of things like research and development and government industry academic relationships sort of to prepare us for this uh, ongoing and, and even a coming challenge? So thank you very much. Thank you, Dave. And good morning, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to join the panel this today. Do, oh. Have I uh, gone up? Uh, zoonotic, over time, zoonotic diseases have challenged the world to become a better place. The 1918 Spanish flu was a devastating catalyst for the creation of centralized public health care systems around the world. Canada initiated an eradication program for bovine brucellosis in cattle in, 19, in 1940s and was declared free of the disease in 1985. Quite an accomplishment. And today, COVID-19 is making history as it reshapes a world with decades of change in mere months. This pandemic has revealed and reinforced many insufficiencies, but also many certainties within the, the livestock industry. The role of research and development in post-pandemic is to identify the strength, these strengths and weaknesses that are apparent and, and that all, all our speakers have spoke about this morning already. The role of government, academia, and if I may add, policymakers, is based around cooperation, collaboration, and sharing to inspire innovation. The Canadian livestock industry has been light years ahead of the world in animal traceability. We know the reputation of our farms is dependent on the continued, continued vigilance and success we have in controlling disease. Dairy Trace, Dairy Farmers of Canada and Lactinet's new National Dairy Cattle Traceability Solution was just launched this month. This system is an important step to prevent spread of disease by enabling ra rapid identification and preventing propagation to other sites, thus limiting the health problem in the short, shortest possible time. But just imagine if traceability tools used in the scrutiny of food were decentralized and the information used to digitize the food, the supply chain and allow deeper insights into opportunities to optimize markets. Post COVID research and development should see greater collaboration be between diverse stakeholders so they can leverage insights from cross disciplinary teams in research, academia, government and policymakers. A great example of this collaboration is the milk sample analysis project being done by Dr. David Kelton at the University of Guelph with cooperation and collaboration from OMAFRA and DFO. Bulk tank milk samples will be tested for yonis, leucosis, and salmonella Dublin. These technology tools of the future will be need to have tools versus the shiny new toy that we had in the past. And as we heard today from all our speakers, our consumer has changed. The industry needs to be aware and prepare for this. While some were posting sourdough recipes on Facebook and others were planting seeds for the first time, others were lining up at the food bank. The population pulled together in the name of protecting our fellow human being. There was an outpouring of appreciation to essential workers and services. And all of a sudden, health and nutrition mattered again and dairy regained its place in a healthy diet. Local food awareness and small markets flourished. Apparently micro restaurants are the future of dining out. Is this a deconcentration of the food chain, of the food supply chain? Will there be more emphasis on premium products versus price? And will the grocery basket be spread out among more than four major retail chains? 
things to watch for in the future. But can you imagine if we had a vaccine, a COVID-19 vaccine developed and released in less than a year, even if it's before or after the US election? We're truly living in a new era of vaccine development on platforms that can be readily adapted to new pathogens. I read that the speed, this speed of the of development is attributed to the sharing of the genetic sequence information when it was discovered. Dissemination of information at all levels of academia and government will accelerate not only research and development, but encourage innovation on the side. I wanna share with you a quote because it resonated with me yesterday. It's Dr. Judith Bryan, who is the chair of IDF, International Dairy Federation. She wrote, with the unprecedented disruption to everyday life that came with lockdown, there have been some surprising positives for the environment. From falling air pollution, decreased use of, of fossil fuels, cleaner beaches and waterways. And this all happened while the dairy sector continued to produce food. I hope those who were so quick to point fingers at the dairy industry and claim it is the source of many of the world's problems will be just as quick to recognize the gains to the environment, which happened while the dairy industry continued to operate. I hope this will prompt more nuanced and constructive dis discussion on climate change, she said. This is what will bring us real sustainable change. Sustainable change. Canadian citizens, and rightly so, expect a better environment in the future. And our industry will continue to be part of that solution. Dairy farmers will improve their sustainable dairy production through multi-pronged approaches. The new environmental module of ProAction, which help, will help producers think of ways to enhance soil quality, find new means to conserve water, and all the while adapting to the impacts of climate change and producing milk for a growing population. The development of a sustainable strategy with a resilient lens is much needed for this industry because large corporate companies are using greenhouse gases and zero carbon targets to hang in their window to attract the newly environmentally conscious consumer. But the COVID pandemic has been a stark reminder that all three dimensions of sustainable development, economic, social, and environmental are instructably linked. And as a farmer, I wanna comment about things on the farm. They've been rolling along fairly normal. Services to the farm were deemed essential early in the pandemic, and most of the province had an exceptional growing season in harvest. Apart from some protocols regarding sanitizing and wearing masks, daily routines are the same. But then are they, after hearing Kelly's presentation? Proaction and classification was delayed for three months while grade A inspections carried on. The ability to meet supply and demand by additional incentive days and quota cuts has limited the disruption and supply management has allowed the sharing of costs among producers without government assistance. But what is missing is the social activities and farmers need these to get off the farm and away from the stress. Without mental health, all the technology in the world does not improve, improve production. But mental health may be an area that will take some time to show the effects of COVID. We need to keep an eye on this and look out for each other. So in conclusion, research and development can look for the bruising from pressure points and collaborate, decentralize and disseminate information to develop a sustainable model with resilience built in. If all dairy industry organizations, government and academia commit to scientific investments to build this resilient model, it will be our guide for a bright and sustainable future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bonnie. Appreciate your your comments and and uh, certainly the uh, the perspective that you bring, uh, particularly as as a dairy producer. 
So I'll begin this part of the program by first thanking all five of our panelists for um, sharing their comments and, and their views um, with us here this morning. And at this point, we will open the webinar to questions from the audience. Um, we've got, we're approaching 11 o'clock, so we've got somewhere 20 to 25 minutes, um, and we'll try to get through as many questions as we have. Again, I will remind our audience that if you do have questions, please, we'd prefer that you enter them through the Q&A box at the bottom. It's a little bit easier for us to track than through the, uh, through the webinar chat section. Um, so there are a number of um, number of questions, and and but perhaps we'll we'll start at the top here. There's and and this one's for Cheryl Smith. Um, Cheryl, the, the question from Robert McKinley is the FCC report on dairy farm revenue shows a reduction and even a predicted dip below cost of production for Eastern Canada in, in 2020. Um, it's, there's a confluence, I think, of factors here, COVID, uh, Kuzma, CETA, um, all playing a role. Um, what, what does Dairy Farmers of Ontario foresee as, as far as things like uh, blend price and, and where that may be going as, as we move into the fall here? Sure, um, thank you. In terms of, um, in terms of overall pricing, um, there is a typical annual review that takes place. So that's underway now. So um, no real comment on that other than to say um, what is taken to, into account there is um, there's a number of costs. There's a number of, of on-farm costs that have gone up uh, due to the COVID impact. And then there's a number of factors that would naturally have costs going down. So that um, all needs to be considered and uh, that will be done including at the national level as well. So that's underway and um, that should be available in the next month or so. As we look at what has happened to blend price, of course, we operate as part of a P5. So when we see that, we know that um, the blend price has been affected by the various um, ups and downs uh, that we've experienced with the um, roller coaster of, of demand and trying to keep up with that. Um, as well, I didn't uh, mention it, but um, it was talked about a little bit earlier. Of course, um, being prepared and ready means even further storage programs um, being done at a, on a national basis. And when we think about it, cheese only exists because um, it's a way to preserve milk. It was a way to preserve milk. And then of course we have butter as well. So there is some storage of that. And, and um, then that may end up um, adjusting the blend price. So we've seen that over the last three months. And as we come into the fall, we see that as um, stabilizing more, but uh, in terms of, of what will happen um, in the future as all those costs are evaluated, we should know more in the next month or so. So that will be forthcoming. As far as CETA and Kuzma goes, as well as any of the trade deals, we know um, the impact of that is of course that um, more imports come into the marketplace. So um, given the um, given the, the variation in demand, it's really hard to tell exactly what that impact has been. But we're monitoring um, imports on a uh, is from the perspective of how that impacts both volume and pricing in the market. So of course, it really depends on the mix of products that are coming in, and uh, so we're monitoring that at all times. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cheryl. Um, a couple of questions have come in, and, and uh, one just uh, just recently, and and um, it, it's about um, isolation protocols for for dairy producers. Um, so the, there was one question here: as we enter the second wave, and community spread is bound to increase, what is the protocol if a farm owner or staff member on a farm comes down with COVID? Uh, how will that potentially impact milk pickups and those types of things? So perhaps, um, Cheryl, I guess I, I might uh, address that one to you as well, or, or perhaps to Bonnie as a, as a board member, if one of the two of you would take that, please. 
Sure, I can start and I'm sure Bonnie will jump in. Um, we're used to tag teaming. So in terms of the um, uh, protocols on farm, um, it, it's critical and we always want to be making sure that, um, you know, we don't become complacent uh, with that. And um, I would say that uh, one, of the, the, one of the components of on farm we see as the most critical um, in terms of ensuring there's no spread, uh, we don't have any 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 spread. Um, is to make sure the sanitary sanitation in the milk house is done well, um, so everyone knows what that is. Also, to make sure that when milk pickups take place, that there is no um, interaction, so that there isn't any uh, ability um, for a spread there. And, um, and then of course, the same thing as milk is delivered to our processors. So those are really, really critical touch points. Um, and then of course, producers know um, that, that they need to be very, very careful if there is um, anything within their family or there, there has been travel or there has been any case that all of the various protocols for even the care of the animal to, to ensure that uh, things are, are kept really um, sanitized and really protected, that use of PPEs, um, but really critical, critical, all those touch points in the milk house. And, and so that's where we've really focused our energy. Bonnie, I don't know if you wanted to add anything. Uh, sure. I, we just discussed this at a board meeting yesterday, so it's a timely question. Um, we are reviewing that protocol and we're reviewing um, how we like how we will deal with this, especially with children going to school and classrooms being sent home to uh, self-isolate. Um, there's a lot of questions out there. We, As Cheryl said, we just ask you to use common sense and respect other people, especially coming onto the farm. Um, as Kelly said too, like um, they they have protocols in place, and we need to respect those and work with them. And um, yeah, all we we just have to be respectful of each other and and uh, do the best that we can. Thanks. Thank you very much, both Cheryl and and Bonnie, for for addressing that question. Um, the next question I'll pose is, is for Kelly and comes from Tom Wright. Um, and Tom says, thanks for your presentation. I'm wondering if you've had conversations when you're talking about human biosecurity with farmers about the importance of having emergency plans for backup labor on the farm uh, in, in case family members or, or others working on the farm need to quarantine or, or self-isolate. Yeah, th thanks, Dave. And, and thanks, Tom, for that question. I think it's a perfect segue following the, the previous question um, because um, we, we absolutely are having these conversations with, with producers about, um, about human health. And, and that's not really anything new. I think veterinarians are often seen as a good uh, trusted resource of information. And so then they, when they have questions about this, we, and we're on the farm and we can, we can speak to it. Um, I would say that when DFO came out with the original, you know, protocols for for reducing the spread and, and making sure that the milk houses were kept clean, there was a, a very clear directive in there about if, if a producer is positive, they are not to be coming into the barn and just exactly as um, Cheryl and Bonnie highlighted. Um, I have had these discussions uh, with, with my farmers and um, perfect example would be uh, I had a client who had returned, had been in Cuba when everything closed down. And so, um, you know, his, his relief milker had to continue um, for two weeks, right? It was, it was a no brainer. He didn't come into the barn. Um, I, everything was communicated via text message. Everything was okay. Um, but, but it certainly showed that, you know, we, we are, we are going to need to have these emergency plans and farmers are going to need um, to think about it. And, um, and we see that at the clinic, even, um, you know, if, if one of our staff members' children get sick, that person can't come to work until, until that's shown, um, that they've shown to have a negative COVID test. And so I think farmers need to be thinking about this, you know, especially exactly what Bonnie said, you know, their kids are going to school. Um, it's going to be tough because um, some of these communities rely on like the, the people in their bubble are the people that they would be getting to get help from. And so I think it's, um, an absolutely um, important conversation for them to have. There's maybe there's good options for them, but maybe there's not. And I think 
Um, if there is one thing that's great about the farming community is that they always pull together, right? If you need that, your baler broke, the last few acres need to get bailed, your neighbor comes. And I think the same thing will happen in this case is, you know what, I need my cows to get milked and I'm, I'm, I'm sick, I can't do it or I'm not allowed. I, I'm, I'm positive that, that the community will, will pull together and help each other out. Thanks very much, Kelly. Appreciate that, that response. Um, the next question I'll direct to Mike von Massow and, and it comes from Tom Wright again. And, and uh, Tom says, if, if we see a shutdown for the second wave, um, particularly in restaurants and, and um, re those, those types of service, food service industries, um, are the processing and distribution systems better positioned to be a little bit more resilient and responding uh, than they were in the first wave as far as being nimble or, or in those terms? Well, well thanks. Uh, I, I, the, the easy answer to that is yes. Uh, it, and and I'll, I'll expand on that a little bit. I, you, you know, we learned some things. Uh, so, so I think uh, there'll be less opportunity for surprise. Uh, the second point I'd make is that uh, we've also... Uh, there is less chance that it is as abrupt as it was before uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, a, uh, the, if there are additional shutdowns for indoor dining, which for the most part has been relatively small, uh, it will probably, we've heard the provincial government say we'll do this regionally. Uh, and so that there will be, it won't be as big and an abrupt change. Food service hasn't come back as far as where it was before. We saw from Cheryl's numbers that retail is still high. So, so the, the, the industry is much better prepared uh, should some of those shifts apply. On the retail side, uh, even if we had significant outbreaks and, and stores had to close, it, would, it, it remains clear that we will get food products, click and collect, internet, and all of those sorts of things. So I think the, 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 I, I have every confidence that we'll still have access to, to dairy products and everything else. The last point I'll make, and I, I maybe reiterate uh, something that uh, probably Cheryl, but I don't remember exactly who said, is that, uh, Supply management, and specifically the central desk selling, has made the, the Canadian system more resilient uh, than, than the U.S. one, in addition to the regionalization. Uh, I think if you look at the degree to which we felt pain on the farm with respect to price, but also the, the length of time that we unfortunately had to dump milk was, was much shorter here. So we had the structure in place uh, we had the relationships in place that that milk could be diverted to people who could meet the demand that we were facing. So we are in better shape to do it. The other thing is we've, we've changed some relationships. It's not just about processors. I had a discussion with the president of Gordon Food Services, uh, who, uh, who, who, who are an exclusive distribution system for restaurants. Clearly the bottom fell out of their business. And the first thing that got busy for them was their trucks, because not only did we have to produce and uh, produce products and divert them uh, to retail, but we had to have trucks to get them done. So, so they were very quickly working with the large retailers to get uh, to get products to the stores and help us adjust. So. We've established new relationships. We've learned some lessons, and I think that the 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 second wave will be much less of a surprise and much less abrupt, uh, and and we're well positioned to get ready, uh, to be ready. Thanks very much, Mike. Appreciate your your response to that. Um, Again, I'll remind our uh, attendees, and, and we've got uh, we've had as many, we've had over eighty people on on uh, the webinar as as uh, as viewers. Um, we still do have a few minutes. If you've got any questions that you would like to address to any of the panelists, please enter those typos in in the, the Q and A box at the bottom. Um, 
I have a question that that perhaps um, either Bonnie or Kelly and and perhaps others might might answer as as well. And certainly, both of you enter, uh, mentioned the the issue of, of mental health and and uh, some of the challenges that the that, that we all face under uh, the these times and so on. Any comments about how we can better prepare ourselves? What resources might be available, and should we think about in terms of providing that support? And I'm not necessarily talking about professional support, but but just as good neighbors and service providers and, and those types of things. Yeah, I, I can go first if you like, Kelly. Sure. Um, uh, we, we were asking our uh, field service reps to touch base with uh, producers who they thought were at risk and just uh, do a little phone uh, catch up and, and we've encouraged producers uh, within their communities to touch base with uh, other producers to find out if, if, you know, things are going okay, if they need any help with anything. Um, some, some people just don't reach out. And if someone doesn't reach into them, then, then we don't know what the issues are. Yeah, I, th I think that's a, a really important point, Bonnie. And I, I guess I, I feel this as a service provider to dairy farms. And I think all people who uh, provide services to dairy farmers are potentially essentially like a first responder, right? Sometimes we're the only people that that farmer sees that week. And um, we also, for, uh, fortunately, one of the, my favorite parts about my job is the relationships that I get to build um, with my clients and, and being able to have those very, maybe more personal conversations, right? You might notice whether it's a, a, a issue with animal care or whether it's just a simple thing of, you know what, that person hasn't got their hair cut in a while, or they're just not looking after themselves. They just plain and simply don't feel like themselves. We might be able to um, pick up on that um, because we are seeing them on, on a regular basis and having the courage and, and it, it, it takes courage to, to ask, Hey, are you okay? No, like, I, I feel like maybe things aren't okay with you and I'm worried about you um, goes a really long way. I think, um, especially for those that don't reach out, hearing from someone else that that they notice that they're not okay um, can have a profound impact of, of a self of a realization that maybe I'm not okay and people care about me and and, and that's good. Um, it's and it's it's also really great for future relationship building as a service provider. Um, one, one thing that I think every person that is a service provider should do is take a mental health first aid training course. Um, they're offered in a lot of communities and. Um, um, do More Ag has really helped to promote that. And many, many um, rural communities have made mental health a priority. Certainly in North Perth, the Listwell Ag Society has, has done so, but I know that's the case in, in many other um, communities across Ontario and, uh, and Canada. Um, the mental health first aid training, I know it sounds intimidating and it, and it is a big course, um, but it, it's well worth it. It's, it's two full days. Um, it's essentially like taking CPR first aid training, but it's for mental health. And um, it's, we, uh, we sponsored one at, at the vet clinic um, for producers and service providers. And I have so much positive feedback and, and people have even commented that they've, uh, they've utilized it in their personal life and, and then with their clients. So um, I can't put enough uh, emphasis behind how important I think that, that that is, but it helps you get the courage that you need to help other people. Dave, can I just jump in? What should, just to reiterate, I think strongly what Kelly said, and and we shouldn't wait till it's acute. Like it, we we we've, we've got we we we're in times now where it is harder to make those connections, and we should just work harder at at reaching out. If you you know if you have gotten a text or an email from someone who you interact with regularly, just just saying hello. You know, I I I was outside. We went to visit our son. I was outside. Uh, on Sunday evening in a park and just hearing other voices and, and seeing, you know, we have to be socially distanced, clearly physically distanced, but we don't need to be socially distanced. You know, take that initiative. It's getting harder to sit on the deck and have a beer, but, but, but working hard at that engagement so that we prevent people from getting to that acute stage uh, and and really are, are, are giving each other, being decent human beings to each other can go a long, long way. 
thank you to all three of you for, for those comments. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions coming in. So we're nearing the end of our time, but what I would like to do is, is perhaps ask each of our panelists if they have one or two closing comments or, or remarks that they'd like to make. And, and perhaps since um, we'll, we'll go in the same order and, and perhaps Mike, I'll ask you to start if there are any final comments you would like to make. Yeah. So, so I'll say two things. Uh, the first is uh, the dairy industry has a lot to be proud of, as has the whole food system with how we've come through here uh, and how we responded to sort of an unbelievably unprecedented shock to the system and, and continue to deliver food to Canadians. And I think we should be confident and proud that, that, that we will continue to. Are there things that we will monitor, are there things that we'll reevaluate as we go forward? Yes, uh, but, but I think there's a lot of value in, in, uh, in, uh, in celebrating what we've done well. And my second point is I'm gonna reiterate the last point we were just talking about, uh, probably the least well understood impact uh, of COVID is not the people who get, who get sick, but the stress that, that we're all under. So. Uh, I'll say what I said before, uh, be a good friend, be a good neighbor, reach out even before things get acute. Thanks very much, Mike. Cheryl, any closing comments? Thanks. Um, you know, I I would echo those comments. I think they're they're right on, and I think that's been a, a, con, a consistent a consistent flow. I guess while um, you know we we really. Um, managed through an incredibly difficult situation. We, um, you know, I am hoping it's the case that um, the increases that are taking place now um, don't turn into uh, a second wave that is, um, you know, far more devastating than the first. Um, but I do agree that at least we're more prepared. Nonetheless, from our perspective, you know, Bonnie mentioned it, um, we are we are going hard at reminding people, being prepared, making sure that the contingencies are in place and re-looking at our contingencies. Because, um, you know, you do need to, there are certain areas where there are pinch points. Um, and if, if someone, uh, you know, if there was to be, um, a breakout that those are critical points of the sector that could that could really be damaged and I think that you know the question around even um, the processing sector so those are all the areas that we just want to continue to reinforce so that um, so that things ca can continue as they have in the past um, and and uh, so we can't we can't uh, we can't take a step back we can't rest we really need to push forward thanks thanks very much Cheryl Kelly any closing comments? I, I don't want to sound like a broken record. I 100% I, I <clears throat> agree with everything that Mike and Cheryl said. I, I couldn't be more um, proud to be part of the dairy industry um, at this time and, and also um, feeling relieved to be a part of the dairy industry at this time. Um, because, and, and I think, um, you know, this webinar is about resiliency. And I, I think without the Online constant of the resiliency of dairy farmers um, ready in place, we wouldn't we wouldn't be where we are um, today. Um, as a service provider, I think we just need to understand and and be okay with the fact that you know what things are going to take a little bit longer, and we might need to um, restructure or uh, I, I still go back to that word nimble, right? We need to be able to adjust and and quickly respond to how things change, um, but but that it'll be okay. And, and to slow down and to take the time to remember that you're customer focused and you need to check in with them, make sure everybody is okay. It doesn't take that much longer in your day um, to, to have those conversations um, and be kind. Thanks, Kelly. Mike McMorris, any closing comments from you? Yeah, so Bonnie mentioned the pandemic of 1918, which I had heard of, but like most people probably didn't really know that much about. Um, when you're starting to live through one, you get more interested in history. So I, I, I've watched a couple of things about 1918 pandemic, and you can't help but shake your head and think, what were they thinking? That was, that was so crazy what they did. And I guarantee you 100 years from now, our grandchildren will be <laughs> history. What on earth were they thinking? 
So at the end of the day, it falls to us all just to do our best. And our best involves taking care of our neighbors, taking care of our industry, uh, taking care of our consumers, they all matter. And I think by and large, we're doing well. And I do agree that um, we have a firefighter who's a neighbor and he said, people don't understand the front line and, and the mental health impacts this is having. He didn't elaborate, I didn't ask him to. So it's, it's extremely real. I do think though that we, uh, while we're in the moment, we do have to keep an eye to the future. Um, you've heard governments in Canada talk about, well, not even just Canada, building back better. I mean, this is a moment in time where people will be looking to build back better. And I think it is really important that the leadership of the dairy sector has their vision of what better is, because there will be people who have visions of better that candidly doesn't even involve a dairy industry. Um, I don't want to overstate that, that, but this is a moment in time where others will be looking to make change that will not meet with your definition uh, of better. And so I, I, as much as absolutely take care of your neighbor, live in the day, do the best we can today, I really hope we, we do keep some very dedicated uh, focus on the future and, and defining what better is uh, for us as well. Thanks again. Thanks very much, Mike. And Bonnie, the last word goes to you. <laughs> the last word. I'd like, I, I've really enjoyed this. I, you know, the, the thought that everyone has put into this and the new, new thoughts in my mind going away from here uh, are excellent. I'd like to build on what Mike McMorris has said. We need a sustainable strategy for the dairy industry and we need it soon because we have these large corporate companies putting 35 year targets in place that 35 years isn't even our responsibility, right? And they're putting targets in place for the next generation and they're just on the environment. And we need to include social and economic in that sustainability uh, study if it's going to be resilient and help us through the next pandemic because there will be another one. So. Uh, Yes, I'd like I'd like to thank everyone. That was it's been very entertaining and very good. Thank you. Thanks very much, Bonnie. So we'll bring this uh, webinar to a close. I'll begin by thanking once last time our our five panelists, um, Bonnie, Kelly, Cheryl, Mike, and Mike, uh, for sharing your insights and your time with us today. Um, I want to, as as Mike McMorris appropriately said, I also want to thank Isege, um for. Um, for doing some of the background work here and certainly Charlotte Wall from the, the Poultry Industry Council for the technical support. Um, Charlotte's been in the background here, uh, sending us chats and notes and, and keeping us uh, well organized. So thank you very much, Charlotte. Um, and again, if I didn't say this at the beginning, the session is being recorded or has been recorded and will be available um, for, for broader distribution and, and reviewing and, and viewing again in the future. So um, on that note, I will um, bring this webinar to a close. Thank you all, stay safe and look after one another. Thank you very much.